Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, as appropriate to wherever you may be joining us from today. As we gather from all over the world, it is important to recognize that McMaster University is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. That wampum uses the symbolism of a dish to represent the territory and one spoon to represent that the people are to share the resources of the land and only take what they need. Something that as guests, we must always be mindful of. Welcome to Devils, Angels, Scoundrels, Fortunes and Fables, British 18th Century Chapbooks and McMaster University Library. Throughout the talk, you are welcome to post questions in chat or using the Q&A feature. Myron Gruber, our rare books librarian, along with alumni staff, our Christine Kennedy is with us in the chat and we'll pass your questions along to be answered at the end. Now let me introduce Jillian Dunks, our speaker for today. Jillian Dunks is Archives Arrangement and Description Librarian in the William Reedy Division at McMaster, where she's worked since 2018. She holds a Master of Arts in English Literature and a Master of Archives, Archival Studies, both from the University of British Columbia. Her MA thesis was on the history of the Ryerson Poetry Chapbook Series, a prominent Canadian series from the 20th century. Her interests include Canadian literature and 19th and 20th century Canadian print cultures, as well as, of course, chapbooks. Her work encompasses archival processing, outreach, and teaching in the division's instruction program. And now with great pleasure, I turn the screen over to Jillian. Thank you, Bridget, for that warm welcome. I'm going to share my slides now. Okay, great. Looks like this is working, which is awesome. Um, so hello, everyone. Welcome to my presentation. You've already heard the title, so no need to uh, repeat it. I'll provide you with a quick roadmap for what we'll be doing in today's session. Uh, so I'm going to provide you with um, a short introduction to chapbook printing in the 18th century. Some of the questions that we'll be thinking about are what actually are chapbooks in this era? Um, who printed them? How were they dis distributed? And who actually read them? Um, then we're going to look at five examples of chapbooks from the 18th and early 19th centuries from the collections of the William Reedy divisions. Um, hopefully I will have time to answer some of your pre-submitted questions. Some of you sent in really wonderful questions, which I'm excited to talk about. Um, and hopefully we'll have time for some additional questions. Um, but if we don't have time, um, you can always email me. Uh, my email address is on the slide and uh, I will do my best to follow up with you. Okay, so chapbooks, why do I specifically care? Um, I am so excited to talk to you about, uh, about this topic. And if you remember nothing else from today, I hope you remember uh, my enthusiasm about this. Um, so this is a photograph of one of the chapbooks that we'll be discussing today. Um, and this is my hand, a photograph taken yesterday. Um, I wanted to give you a sense of how um, small some of these items are. So my background is in English literature, as Bridget um, has said. Um, I completed an MA thesis looking at a prominent Canadian chapbook series in the 20th century. Um, but I actually came to chapbooks um, earlier than that. I came to them um, in my undergrad degree in my second year. And what happened was I was invited to a chapbook making workshop. Um, and this was really my first encounter with um, thinking about books and about uh, print culture and really thinking about books as kind of material objects. Um, it was a really exciting experience for me. And as I got kind of deeper um, into the work and into the research, I was really um, encountering components of the fine print tradition for the first time. So things like hand-sewn bindings, um, good quality papers, um, as well as illustrations. And this is probably the type of um, work that you're familiar with too. Um, something that we have to keep in mind though is that the chapbooks that we might be familiar with now in the 21st century are actually using the term chapbook as a kind of conscious anachronism. And they're hearkening back to the small booklets that were cheap to make and buy, which were read by working class people, uh, children, and many others from the early 16th to um, 19th centuries in Europe. These little books are heavily represented in the pre-1800 disbound collection um, at the William Reedy Division. Um, why I particularly care about them is spending time with the chapbooks of this era, I think really broadens and um, deepens our understanding of British literature 
which encompasses profane verse as well as um, the more kind of sophisticated tales that we might be used to. Um, looking at these in the context of the 18th century is really compelling because this is really the last era of letterpress printing. Um, and letterpress printing after this time is about to be um, superseded by newer print technologies of the 19th century. Um, a note about this presentation, uh, again, we're focusing on the 18th century. This is a period with a very um, rich and turbulent political history, but uh, we really won't have time to get into the weeds about this. Um, so today we're focusing more on um, the print history. Now, what actually is a chapbook? Um, we think that the term chapbook might come to us from Chapman. The origins of Chapman are uh, from the old English cheap man, which means um, trade and man. Chapmen were um, peddlers and they were a really important part of the distribution network for chapbooks. Um, from a bibliographic perspective, the question of what chapbooks are is a really um, complex issue. One uh, extremely cranky bibliographer notes that the term um, is a bibliographic conceit um, because it's been applied to so many different kinds of texts over five centuries that it no longer has any um, inherent meaning. Um, it was also long thought that the term chapbook was only used um, retrospectively from the 19th century on to describe a form of literature that had um, by then disappeared. Um, but some more recent research has um, uncovered some uses of the term in uh, the mid 18th century. Generally speaking though, the volumes that we'll be talking about today um, would not have been described as chapbooks at the time. Um, it would have been more common to see them in booksellers catalogs um, as histories. That would be a, like a common description. Um, there are some kind of general characteristics though that scholars uh, agree upon. Um, and these are the unique format of the books, um, their cheapness relative to other printed books at the time, um, their mode of distribution and uh, their subject matter. John Simons provides a really excellent working definition of the chapbook's um, physical format. So it is um, tends to be a single sheet of paper, which is printed on both sides and then folded so as to make a book of 12 leaves or 24 pages. Um, it's also possible to find some variation within this. So, you know, today we're going to talk about some eight page chapbooks and there are also 36 page chapbooks. Um, chapbooks tended to be sold unopened. So what this uh, would mean is that um, they, the pages would have to be cut by the purchaser. And um, also they tended to include at least one woodcut or wood engraving. They were fragile and they were printed on a poor quality paper usually. Um, we can add to this definition some information about the chapbook's distribution um, and also its content. Uh, many chapbooks were distributed by the Chapman or itinerant peddlers. Um, and in terms of content, they tended to be either um, abridgments from longer works um, and they tended to have plebeian associations. Um, chapbooks also formed part of a genre of inexpensively printed materials called street literature. And in my next slide, we'll, uh, we'll look a little bit. These are some examples of street literature that I've pulled from our collections. So what you see on the left-hand side is um, a broadside uh, entitled, The Woman That Wished She Had Never Got Married. Um, I'm sure you will all be curious to come in and find out why she, why she wished that. Um, on the right-hand side, there are some chapbooks that we'll be talking about uh, today. So chapbooks form part of this tradition of print um, that runs parallel to the tradition of the rare books that we are probably more um, well acquainted with. So printing begins in England in 1476. Um, and at this time, publishers produce books. And these are accessible to uh, a privileged few um, people who can afford them. Uh, these volumes that are produced tend to be reflective of um, the themes, the language, and the outlook of what um, one historian called sophisticated society. These books um, probably would have been accessible only to church dignitaries, uh, noblemen, scholars, merchants, and uh, gentlemen with private libraries. From the very beginning, though, there was also a tradition of street literature or inexpensive um, ballad sheets, pamphlets, and ephemera for the masses. These types of publications would um, inform the working classes and the poor of important political events, um, and they were also simply entertaining. Street literature of this period included broadsides, um, like you see on the left, uh, and those were single sheets of paper printed on one side, and they frequently incorporated text and woodcut images, um, chapbooks, a type of publication called garlands, which were um, songbooks, um, and later on, newspapers. More ballads and chapbooks survive from the period after the Stuart Restoration in 1660 than before, 
Um, and we shouldn't be super surprised by this because there was a lot of political turmoil that preceded this period, um, including the English Civil War. The chapbook and other um, types of street literature flourished in the 18th century, and they circulated in their hundreds of thousands to many remote parts of England, Wales, and uh, Scotland. I'll just pause here to note um, also that chapbooks and other forms of street literature were also present um, in many other European countries. Uh, most famous among these is the French Bibliothèque Bleue. This is um, a chapbook-like publication uh, from France, and that was published from 1602 to 1830. Um, and there are also similar publications in uh, Germany, in Russia, in Italy, and Spain. Um, moreover, we should not necessarily assume that all of the street literature um, in this region was in English. Uh, most of it was, but there is also a very robust tradition um, from the 18th century on of Welsh language, uh, ballad and chapbook publication. Um, the collections at McMaster, though, are predominantly in English, and many were printed in England, so uh, these will be our focus for today. Okay, so on to the physical format of chapbooks. Um, in this era, it's important to remember that printing is still a letterpress process, as I've mentioned. Um, in letterpress printing or relief printing, Copies of an image are produced by repeated direct impressions of an inked raised surface against sheets of paper. The ink bearing surface for text is produced through um, manual assembly of pieces of type by a typesetter line by line. Letterpress printing is the dominant printing mode in Europe from the mid 15th century to the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, what this photograph is on the slide is a modern replica of a late 18th century English common press, and we have um, names for all the parts. I wish I had a little more time to uh, get into the weeds of how this process would actually work, but um, it's fair to say that it was a, a manual process. It was labor intensive, um, and it, you know it was the dominant mode. On to the physical format of the chapbooks, particularly. Um, chapbooks were made by printing on one or both sides of a single sheet of paper. The sheet of paper would then be folded in a particular way. It would be folded in half and then in half again, continuing down until the correct size was reached. Um, then the main fold, which was usually down one of the long sides, would be hand sewn and the remaining edges would be trimmed to form pages so that the whole thing would become a small paper covered book. The image on this slide is a sheet of common duodecimo or a single page folded 12 times to yield a booklet of 24 pages. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see in the image, but um, the page numbers are marked, um, the cut lines are indicated, and also uh, if you're curious about what this kind of fleur de lis thing is, um, that would be the watermark on, on the paper. Um, this image is of the Robin Crusoe chapbook, Robinson Crusoe chapbook that we'll discuss later. Um, and what you see here is that the hand stitching um, is intact. So again, once the volume was folded and its pages were cut, it would be hand sewn. This would usually happen um, the purchaser would usually do this, but um, sometimes cheap labor was was employed to do this as well. And lastly, chapbooks often featured um, a woodcut illustration. This would sometimes be on uh, the cover, sometimes it would be a fold out frontispiece, um, and the function of this was really to encourage the reader to be interested in the content. Um, this is an image from a chapbook that we'll discuss later entitled The Gloucestershire Tragedy. So this is a woodcut image, um, and we see on this page um, a printer's mark as well, uh, the letter A, which would um, assist the printer in correctly assembling the volume. Um, again, in, in woodcut printing, knives and other tools are used to carve designs into the surface of a wooden block. The raised areas which remain are then um, inked, and they're used to make an impression on the page. Um, chapbook printers tended to use the same um, illustration blocks repeatedly until they wore out. In terms of chapbook content, um, this is where we get the title of the talk. Um, you know, in some respects, what, what wasn't in chapbooks? Uh, chapbooks retold old romances and fairy tales. They related stories of ancient battles. They rehashed superstitions and riddles. They interpreted dreams, foretold the future, exhorted sinners to repentance, or uh, simply cracked jokes. Um, Samuel Pepys, who is seen in the image on uh, the right, was a famed English diarist and a naval administrator, and he is uh, probably one of the most prominent chapbook collectors of the 17th century. Um, between 1661 and 1688, he collected hundreds of chapbooks and he arranged for them to be bound into four volumes, 
Um, and he came up with four categories to describe their content. He called them penny witticisms, uh, merriments, compliments, and godlinesses. Uh, witticisms might include um, light verse, merriments and compliments would include um, courtship books and jest books, and godlinesses would be um, kind of more didactic uh, religious books. So we see in, um, especially in the late 18th century, that certain religious groups and societies begin to use the chapbook format to promulgate some of their um, ideas. Some chapbooks were also condensed versions of the longer printed works that, um, you know, the novelistic works that were uh, available to more prosperous readers. So Robinson Crusoe, again, is our, our main example. Um, what's really remarkable about chapbooks, too, is that many of them preserve um, Middle English romances whose history can be traced back to the 13th century, if not further. So we see in the chapbooks um, versions of Guy of Warwick and Valentine and Orson, for example. Um, as one historian, Leslie Shepard, writes, these cheaply printed remnants of the old noble tales have a beauty beyond all sophisticated verse. Um, they're kind of they're cultural through lines during periods of tremendous social and political upheaval. Um, one thing I will say, though, is that um, chapbooks are political to the extent that they um, express the values of the milieus in which they were created. But um, they did not tend to comment directly on the political circumstances of their day. They have um, kind of more of a timeless quality. Um, they have probably more in common with the jest books and the ballads of the Elizabeth Elizabethan age, um, and not necessarily the flood of political pamphlets and broadsides generated by the Civil War and the Commonwealth period. This is my slide on printers. Um, I find this topic fascinating, but uh, I think for some, it may be a little heavy going, so bear with me. Um, printing comes to Europe in the mid 15th century. We're probably all familiar with um, Gutenberg, who introduces movable type in Germany and begins a printing revolution in Europe. Um, theoretically, at the time, most European uh, printers are part of guilds or uh, federations of master tradesmen, but by far the most restrictive of these is the Stationers Company of London. So the Stationers Company holds a royal charter which grants a monopoly over printing in England and Wales from 1557 to 1695. The company controls um, entry to the trade, it regulates wages and conditions of employment, it protects printers' rights to produce titles, and it cooperates with the government in censorship of the press. The Stationers Company effectively ensured that the British book trade was concentrated in London up until um, the late 18th century. Philip Gaskell, um, a prominent bibli bibliographer, some of you may know, um, not such a fan of the Stationers Company. Um, he argues that at the beginning of the 16th century, English printing is relatively unimportant in relation to what's happening in continental Europe. Uh, printing arrives late in England in 1476, and it is slow to develop. Um, he argues that although England's political importance in Europe increases significantly over the next two centuries, this is not necessarily accompanied by a corresponding advance in the book trade. Um, and from his perspective, it's not really until the stationers um, hold on the market relaxes in the 18th century that English printing becomes um, equal to its European neighbors and uh, eventually, in his opinion, surpasses it. It's important to note um, that in Scotland uh, and also in Ireland, the stationers company does not um, hold sway. In Scotland, particularly, the printing industry coalesces in Glasgow from about 1680 to the mid 18th century. How does um, the stationers monopoly uh, actually work? I thought this was really interesting um, for people who think about you know, copyright now, we're sort of used to the idea that the person who creates a work um, is the person who is entitled to, to the copyright for that item. Um, and this was not the case during the time. Um, so what the stationers were really interested in was protecting the rights of publication to particular um, titles for their members. Um, titles to particular works tended to be sold at trade sales, and these were only open to um, guild members. Printers would purchase the rights to particular works, and then they would write their ownership of the title into the stationer's um, hall book. Once the title had been recorded in the hall book, no other members were able to publish or to copy the work. Um, thus, the register of the stationers becomes one of the most important documentary records that we have for the print culture of this era. 
Um, William St. Clair argues that uh, what we see during this period is also that the stationers kind of freeze the canon of popular literature. Um, the stationers are interested in certain titles which are, you know, kind of proven to be popular, um, and they sell and resell those titles again and again to one another. Um, this is the, the high monopoly period of British publishing. But what happens um, in kind of the late 17th century and 18th century is that we get two kind of major blows that are, are dealt to the stationers. Um, first of all, in 1695, the Licensing Act lapses. And what this means is that the number of, um, the act had limited the number of master printers. And accordingly, the number of printers um, rises significantly throughout the 18th century. One statistic that I read said that there was a 400% increase in the number of printers um, doing work during this time period. Um, and then in 1774, there is a successful legal challenge in the House of Lords against the stationers. And this opens the door to large scale reprinting of literary works of many kinds. Um, what we see in this period too, is that a robust provincial printing industry begins to really take off. And this um, kind of also signals the death knell for um, some of the types of traditional street literature that the stationers and their syndicates would have been uh, producing. There is one um, major printer of chapbooks that um, it's worth pointing out in the 18th century among um, many. And this is the Dicey Marshall Partnership, which operated out of two different locations. Um, one was in Bow Churchyard and one was in Aldermary Churchyard. Um, the image on the right is the Aldermary Churchyard um, location. So the business begins in 1719 at Bow Churchyard. Um, it's a family business. Uh, the owner is William Dicey, who is a newspaper printer. And the business passes in 1740 to his son, who um, reopens the business in partnership with a man named Richard Marshall. Um, the Dicey Marshall business really dominates the trade. Um, their output is so significant that many of the regional and kind of rural printers um, tend to copy their works. Um, typical print runs. This is a challenging question, trying to figure out um, how many chapbooks would have been circulation in particular regions in any um, given year. So it's difficult to extrapolate the print runs in part because um, many historians have had difficulty locating um, inventory lists from publishing syndicates. So for example, um, the Ballad Partners were uh, some of the major producers of chapbooks in the 17th century. Um, and we don't have you know, a lot of their inventory lists at this point. Um, looking at the stationer's registers can actually be um, not super helpful too if we're looking for a particular um, format because only, um, only the title of the work is recorded, not necessarily the format. So it's possible that a publisher could purchase the title and release it as both a broadside and a chapbook. And you know, how, how would we know? Um, one of the ways that we can uh, figure out the, the print runs though is by looking at probate inventories of the period. Um, this has been a really helpful um, resource type for scholars. Um, one good example that comes to us from the 17th century is uh, the printer Charles Tias, who dies in 1664. Um, the estimate that is given at the time of his uh, paper stock and his ready to go items is that there would be about 90,000 um, chapbooks that he that he printed alone. Um, Margaret Spufford, who's another uh, important historian of kind of the 17th century chapbook, compares this to the stationers registers and the population at the time um, in England. And she concludes that um, it's possible that chapbooks could have reached about one in 15 uh, families at the time. Um, I also saw another statistic which suggested that um, in Scotland, there were around 200,000 chapbooks being produced um, every year. So from this, we can probably um, estimate that hundreds of thousands of chapbooks were circulating every year um, in England. Thank you for bearing with me for the print history section. Um, now we'll move on to probably some of the more, more scintillating uh, stuff. So who actually wrote uh, the chapbooks? With few exceptions, they uh, tended to be published anonymously. Um, to complicate matters further, they were often um, adapted from folk and fairy tales with no clear um, origin. Um, Harry Weiss, another chapbook historian, um, writes that we really need to distinguish between the um, author, so the creative locus, maybe the source of the fable or, or folk tale, um, and the writer, who is the person who wrote the words of the chapbook. Um, we often don't know who the author is, but we can safely assume that the writer of chapbooks in most instances is also the, um, the printer. That would be the person who's um, you know, adapting the works and, and developing the words 
Um, and again, there are chapbooks which are um, abbreviated versions of, of novels with authors. And now we're on to distribution. Um, this very lovely image of um, a Chapman. This is an image of a Chapman from a 16th century volume of the Book of Trades. So chapbooks could be distributed in a number of ways. Um, they could be sold directly to purchasers via catalog, but uh, more often they were sold by printers at wholesale prices to vendors, including booksellers and Chapman, who then resold them at a markup. Um, Chapmen were a really vital link between urban booksellers and rural readers, but they were um, often kind of unfairly stereotyped as being rough or suspect uh, characters. So uh, writing in 1882, one uh, Victorian era bibliographer writes, um, the Chapman's life seems to have been an exceptionally hard one. He appears on his own confession to have been as much of a rogue as he well could be with impunity. And as his character was well known, very few roofs would shelter him. Um, historians have pointed out, though, that many Chapmen could actually read and write um, skills which were by no means universal at the time, and many joined the trade um, either in hopes of making their fortune or um, maybe escaping from a, a destiny as an agricultural worker trapped in the village of their birth. Um, Chapmen again purchased chapbooks and ballads at wholesale uh, prices, and then they would mark up the final retail price um, heavily. An interesting um, factoid is that a uh, place that they were known to congregate in the 17th century was um, London Bridge, which was uh, considered to be a rough part of town. Um, Chapman also carried other wares, so they would carry um, scissors, ribbons, perfumes, uh, medicines, and the types of manufactured goods that would probably not be made um, locally. They also bought as well as sold, so they were really um, a vital part of the kind of economics of these rural villages. Um, one example of a type of thing they would buy is um, hair. They would often buy hair from local village girls um, to sell to wig makers um, in town. Um, peddlers and chapmen were required to be licensed in the 17th century. Um, and from some of these records, we get a sense of the number of chapmen circulating. Um, in 1696, uh, we get um, some records which reveal that there are 2,500 chapmen operating in this year uh, alone. Now we're kind of at our, our final piece of the chapbooks um, printing question, which is or the sort of print culture around chapbooks question, which is who actually read them. Um, in general, we have to think about literacy. Would people in this period from um, lower income groups uh, actually have been able to read? And also what is the relationship between the kind of expanding reading public and the um, increased availability of chapbooks? Um, again, I return to Margaret Spufford's words. Um, she argues in general that from 1500 to 1700, we could sort of productively characterize um, English society as moving from uh, an oral society ruled by an educated elite to a semi-literate society in which some members, even from the poorest social groups, um, can read. Education in England um, remained closely linked to religious institutions until the 19th century, although there were also uh, charity schools and free grammar schools that were open to children of all religious backgrounds. Um, university education was heavily socially restricted. Um, it's not until the 19th century that we begin to see a series of legislative reforms which um, expand education programs uh, for children and ensure that state funded schools are opened. And it's not actually until 1880 that we see that elementary education becomes um, compulsory for children aged five to 10. Prior to this time, um, poor children uh, could expect in their lifetimes to form part of the laboring population uh, within their childhood. Um, when we're trying to ascertain who can actually read um, for this period, there's really only one standard literacy skill that we can utilize as an index of literacy for the population, and that is the ability to sign one's name. Um, 17th century historians often look to the protestation returns of 1642 uh, for evidence of this. These are lists usually compiled by parishes of um, English men who took or did not take an oath of allegiance to live and die for the Protestant faith. Margaret Spufford estimates that um, based on looking at, at this particular documentary source, um, we could say about 30% of men in the latter half of 17th century England could read and a fair number of women could as well. Um, how did they learn though, especially if you were from um, a kind of a, a poorer background? Um, we have here some accounts from 17th century autobiographers 
And um, their accounts indicate that children might expect to begin schooling between the ages of six to eight. Curriculum would, would begin uh, with reading and it would eventually progress to um, writing in Latin. Um, girls and boys are, are capable of receiving this education, um, but writing tends to be uh, more restricted to boys. Um, when a child is able to cope with a full working day, they would likely be um, withdrawn, and that tends to happen around the age of um, seven. So what we see is that many people um, have some basic literacy skills they can read, but writing is a less common skill because it is taught um, after the meaningful earning lives of children uh, would have actually begun. Um, prior to the late 18th century, uh, in general, lower income groups would likely only have had access to um, the English language Bible, uh, chapbooks, and ballads. So that's really it. Um, but by the end of the 18th century, the population in England has grown um, substantially, and the reading public has too because of um, expanded access to elementary education, um, and also because of this significant uh, change in the English book trade. We see more types of printed material starting to become uh, available, and around this period, um, school education begins to make the reading of extracts of English literature a central part of the um, curriculum. We return again to Margaret Spufford, who notes, um, looking at parish uh, marriage records in 1839, um, that we can kind of extrapolate that by this period, there's been a really big jump in literacy. So we have about 70% of men and 50% of women who have um, some literary literacy skills. Um, this relationship between the uh, increased number of readers and also the increased number of publications can probably productively be thought of as one of um, mutual reinforcement. There is an increased reading public and publishers are responding to that by producing more works. Um, simultaneously, people are learning to read and they're learning to read in part um, by looking at some of these materials like chat books um, and, and ballads. Now on to uh, prices. Chat books retailed at prices of a penny up to uh, four pence or six pence, so four or, or six pennies. Um, what we see in this image on the uh, left is again our trusty Robinson Crusoe chat book. Um, and we see that this is um, listed at a retail price of one penny. Um, I want to kind of briefly um, put the, the idea of the chat book's cheapness in um, context. And John Simons has a really uh, wonderful kind of contextual quote about this. Um, so in 1795, an agricultural laborer in the south of England had a weekly income of about 40 pennies, um, but the bare necessities of life to support a family would cost more like 48 pennies. Um, so in this context, the risking of even one uh, penny on a chat book might have been um, an extravagant gesture. Um, the other thing is that if chat books or other forms of street literature were purchased, um, they would likely fulfill a, a pressing secondary need for a lavatory paper. So it's actually kind of amazing that, you know, we have any of these um, at all. The, the fact that we, you know, have some in special collections, um, you know, does tend to be the result of uh, collectors, you know, people like Peeps who are really interested in, in these books. Um, kind of deducing the readership of the chat books from the contents and from the prices is a little bit of an inherently flawed um, exercise. A lot of people look at them and say, you know, well, they're a cheap publication type, um, ergo, they must have only been read by the working poor. Um, and that is not uh, the case. As we see from Peeps, uh, members of all social strata read chat books, um, but it was considered a little bit embarrassing to, to admit that you did. Um, several prominent writers um, of this era spoke in their adulthood of having read chat books as children. So um, the poet John Clare and, and William Wordsworth did, um, and also Charles Dickens did as well. Um, there's also strong evidence from firsthand accounts that um, more affluent and middle-class children would purchase their own um, chapbooks. So now we're going to transition to actually talking about um, the items and talking about some of the collections at McMaster. Um, the items we're going to talk about today come from McMaster's Disbounds uh, collection. Uh, really quick, what is a Disbound? A Disbound is a book or a pamphlet that was once bound and from which the binding has been um, removed. Our collection comprises 7,688 um, items, and there's a really wide range of items. Um, you know, there are some pamphlets, chat books, uh, broadsides. Um, the collection is predominantly in English, um, although there are some items in French, 
I consulted uh, around 200 chat books in preparing for this presentation, but um, I think that there could be you know, more potentially. Um, there is a heavy representation of English and Scottish printers. Um, the collection is not available uh, online in a digital format um, yet, but stay tuned. Um, the five items that we're talking about today will be available though um, in our digital archive. So our first item is the Gloucestershire tragedy being an account of Miss Mary Smith in Thornbury who poisoned her father, Sir John Smith, for love of a young man. So this was likely printed in 1776. As the title page notes, um, it was printed and sold uh, in Bow Churchyard, which means that this is a dicey and martial publication. The author is not identified, which is um, typical. The volume is 12 pages in length and it clocks in at 10 by 16 centimeters and has um, two woodcut illustrations. So this is a pretty typical chat book. Um, it has some prick marks along the spine, which you can't see in this image, uh, which indicate that hand stitching uh, was present, but um, has you know, kind of since dissolved or fallen out. Um, in terms of content, um, you know, I find this to be a tough read as a 21st century reader, but I think that probably wouldn't have been the case uh, for an 18th century reader. Um, the volume it contains a long poem in iambic tetrameter with rhymed couplets. It is about a woman of noble birth who falls in love with a wig maker who is an unsuitable man. Her father uh, opposes the match, so she poisons her father with mercury. She is later publicly executed for her crime, but prior to her execution, she repents and she exhorts those gathered uh, to watch to see that the Lord you love and fear and honor your parents dear. Um, David Stoker writes of this specific chapbook that um, it's a good example of a chapbook genre called an 18th century verse cock. Um, this would be a fictional story dressed up as a true account. Um, local records have no trace of a Mary Smith of Thornbury or of any such execution in Gloucester. Um, nevertheless, the contents of this chapbook were hugely popular and it was reprinted well into the 19th century. Um, I think it's fair to say we could categorize this chapbook as both a, a merry and a godly book. Um, its narrative is undeniably quite titillating, um, and it's pretty typical of 18th century society's obsession with crime. Um, yet it's also encased within these Christian pieties um, that don't really fully neutralize the frisson that the tale might have elicited for the reader. Um, this type of chat book, I think, would surely have been read uh, as much for enjoyment as it would be for any, you know, spiritual guidance that it uh, presented. The chat book includes um, a hymn, but what we see in the image on the left-hand side um, is actually the lovelorn wig maker who gets the last word. Um, this is one of his love letters to, to his beloved. Um, letters like this um, and epistolary chat books in general um, may have served a really important additional social function at the time of teaching readers how to cement a romantic relationship through letter writing. On to our next item. Um, this is my favorite item probably that we'll talk about. Uh, this is Nine Pennyworth of Wit for a Penny. Um, this chapbook was published in 1800 by uh, Margaret M. M. Angus is Margaret Angri Angus and son in Newcastle in Northeast uh, England. So the first thing I want to point out here is that um, women were involved in the print industry, um, and the most common way to be involved in the print industry was to um, inherit a press from your deceased husband. Um, so in 18th century England, guild privileges would still be granted to the widow of a, of a guild member. Um, so we think that may be what happens. After London, uh, Newcastle was one of the most important centers of chapbook production in the 18th century, um, and no less than three major printers were active there. And the Newcastle printers were addressing the needs um, of the English chapbook market, but also the Scottish market due to their um, proximity. Um, and the printers in this region also produced a huge number of songs and broadside ballads. Um, nine Pennyworth contains 24 pages. Um, it clocks in at nine and a half by 17 centimeters. We see in the title image that um, it depicts a man bestriding the globe surrounded by implements of knowledge like the book and symbols of wealth like the open coin chest. Um, the chat book's contents are divinatory in nature. The book is ranged in 28 sections. Um, one of the sections is entitled, just to give you a, a sample of the content, um, signs of love and speedy marriage uh, by seeing or meeting diverse sorts of creatures first thing in the morning. Um, 
my favorite section is a treatise on moles in sundry parts of the body as they relate in love and uh, business. And the title of this book indicates, um, you know, that you're receiving a real bargain. You're getting ninefold uh, value from this item. So I'm going to give you some some quotes from this book um, about moles. Uh, a mole on the left side of the forehead denotes that the party will get riches by tilling, building, and planting. Uh, by contrast, two moles answering equally on either side of the gullet threatens untimely death. Um, other themes include palmistry, uh, dream interpretation, and observations on um, the weather. Uh, practical guides to divination were really common fare at um, traveling fairs, and they would have been you know, pretty familiar to rural readers, um, particularly those who were interested in seeking a marriage partner. Um, this is a page in the volume. It might kind of be hard to see in the slides, um, but this is a divinatory guide which would assist a woman who is looking for a husband. So the idea is that you would use the numerical chart um, and also a dice, um, and then you would draw a number which corresponds on the next page to a prediction about your husband. Um, one of the quotes here is, a man unto thy lot will fall straight, but neither short nor tall. So a, a medium height man, I suppose. Um, on to the history of Valentine and Orson. Um, this is a really weird item. I'm really fond of this chat book uh, as well. So this was printed in 1790 by Charles Sutton in um, Nottingham, East Midlands. Um, again, what we see here is that by the end of the 18th century, we have many more printers working in regions outside of London. This chat book is 16 pages in length. It clocks in at 10 by 16 centimeters. Um, it includes a number of decorative fleurons. Um, it has on the title page this note that it is printed for the company of walking stationers. And for a long time, I just like could not figure out what this was. I thought like, was this like a, like a partner of the stationers company? Um, I uncovered a reference finally in the work of William St. Clair. And he argues that this is a, a reference, um, kind of a preferred term of the distribution network of, of Chapman, which in the 18th century was um, as protected as the print industry was. Um, the, I think that the, the woodcut illustration that we see here is probably more connected to the mode of distribution to the company of walking stationers than it is to the, um, the content of the volume. Um, on to the content. Oh, okay. I think I've skipped ahead a little bit here. Um, Valentine and Orson is a medieval romance of French origin. Um, it's part of the Carolingian cycle, which is kind of one of the three great um, Western story cycles repeated in medieval literature. Um, alongside the matter of Britain, which includes the Arthurian legends. Um, John Simons notes that this story was imported from France and Burgundy to England in the late 15th century. Um, the story was hugely popular and it continued to be printed well into the 18th century. Um, it's the tale of twin brothers who are abandoned in the woods in um, infancy. Valentine is discovered and he is brought up as um, a knight at the court of King Pepin, who is uh, a real life son of Charlemagne and a Frankish king, while um, Orson grows up in a bear's den and becomes a wild man of the woods. Um, Valentine eventually goes into the woods as an adult, discovers his brother um, and tames him, and then the two go on to have a variety of very exciting um, adventures. Uh, one of their adventures that's a, a recurring motif is that they rescue their mother Bellisant from uh, a giant. So the tale is really a collection of many of the common motifs of European romance. Um, and in this chapbook version, what makes it kind of so weird is that um, this sort of information from the Carolingian cycle gets kind of mashed up with Arthurian legends in um, unusual ways. So this Sutton chapbook contains um, six chapters. In this version, Valentine and Orson are still nephews of King Pepin. Um, the chapbook kind of hits the typical notes of the tale uh, up until Valentine and Orson meet the Green Knight. Um, so the Green Knight is a figure from the Arthurian literary tradition. Um, he's kind of a multivalent and, and complicated figure in his symbolism, but he's usually considered to be kind of a tester of um, knights. Um, in this con in this chapbook, the Green Knight is a, a pagan figure. Um, and he is spared from death. He's defeated by Valentine and Orson and he uh, is converted to Christianity. Um, and eventually he goes on to kind of rule a corner of Christendom in um, Orson's stead. Um, again, I think it's worth pointing out here that although chapbooks are not um, political, right? They're, um, 
conveying these sort of deep ideas in the culture. And what we're seeing in this case is kind of British nationalism and, and xenophobia. I want to give you um, a sense of some of the language and the thematic content of this book, um, kind of some of the beauty of the old tales. Um, so I'll read you the last passage, which is about um, Orson's death. After living to a great age, the magnanimous and invincible hero surrendered up his body unto never sparing death and his soul to the immortal deities of whose attributes it had a true resemblance. I really love that. Okay. On to Robinson Crusoe. This is the chapbook that I've probably used the most images from. Um, it's a really interesting little volume and it, it, it tells us a lot about um, the era. So this is a chapbook which exemplifies um, abridgment practices at this time. As many of you probably know, uh, the Crusoe novel was one of the most popular of its era. Um, it was published in 1719 and it was written by Daniel Defoe. Um, it tells the story of an English sailor who participates in the slave trade along the west coast of Africa. Um, he is shipwrecked and he then settles on an island for 30 years, um, eventually taking on an indigenous servant named Friday. And Crusoe imposes on Friday um, English customs, language, and uh, religion. In Defoe's lifetime, um, England was actively expanding its empire by acquiring colonies in North America and the Caribbean, as well as um, reaping economic benefits from participation in the Atlantic slave trade. Um, Defoe, as a person, was really enthusiastic about these processes, um, and this is reflected in uh, the novel. Copyright for the novel, um, surprisingly, was originally owned by uh, its, its first publisher in 1719, um, and copyright for the book um, basically was held by this small kind of cartel of London publishers until 1752, who kept selling and reselling um, the title, and they uh, managed to inflate the value of the item by 200% in this um, small period. Um, however, due to a loophole in the 1710 Copyright Act, um, abridgments could often be published of copyright protected uh, books, and it was not generally um, worthwhile for publishers to try to, um, you know, pursue kind of damages for this infringement. Uh, it was it, kind of a long and costly process. Um, so Robinson Crusoe was probably one of the most popular um, chat books of its era, too. It was uh, abridged and reprinted in chat book form um, thousands of times. And some scholars have even argued that these um, abridgments were uh, essential to the title's kind of evergreen popularity and to its um, eventual canonization. Um, this particular version was published in 1800 by, or 1800 by P. Norbury of um, Brentford, West London. Uh, it contains 31, item, or 31 pages, and it is our smallest item at six and a half by um, 10 centimeters. It features five um, illustrations. Um, and the illustration that we actually see on this page um, is uh, an image, Im a pretty good imitation actually of the frontispiece, which appeared in the first edition of um, the novel. Um, in terms of content, a common interpretation of the novel is that it is a, a justification of Europeans' rights to uh, appropriate the lands of indigenous peoples on the principle that uh, land becomes the property of those who cultivate it. Um, Crusoe is kind of a, a prototypical colonist. He is the embodiment of the imperial impulse to kind of go out into the world and dominate it. Um, and the chapbook version that we're talking about here um, really supports this reading in a very um, uncomplicated way. Um, it presents a very simple narrative about the assertion of kind of British dominance over the land and uh, people that Crusoe meets. Um, and it replicates kind of key points in the novel, um, such as the conversion of Friday. Um, these values are, are obviously uh, unconscionable and, and repugnant, but um, you know they were very popular at this time and they were uh, widely circulated. Now we move on to our last item, which is um, nimble and quick, pick and choose where you will, containing the humors of the age. This is a short book of aphorisms on a range of subjects, uh, mostly body. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, the volume is heavily soiled, which we might be tempted to interpret as a sign of frequent use. Um, the chat book contains eight pages and it measures 12 and a half by 19 centimeters. Um, it really gives us very little information to work with this item in terms of a, um, a publisher or a printing location. There's no identified publisher. There's no identified author. Um, all we know from the bookseller is that it was likely produced um, in 1770. 
The title page uh, illustration depicts some men engaged in a form of leisure. This looks to me like lawn bowling or something, but you know, perhaps people will have uh, other ideas. Um, in our copy, what you can see in this image is that um, the hand stitching, which would hold this item together, is much decayed. So, um, you know, this is a thing that happens to chapbooks in, in special collections over uh, over time. Here are some pithy quotes. Um, these quotes touch on typical chapbook themes, um, boilerplate misogyny, the professions, um, drinking, religion, and uh, prejudice against people from other countries, um, in this particular chapbook, the French. So I'll read you a couple of quotes. I think they demonstrate the full range of ideas, both problematic and funny in these books. Um, the first quote, number me the sands on the seashore and the stars in the sky, and I will number you the numberless faults of a lewd woman. Yet a virtuous woman is the pride of nature and the glory of the universe, but where shall I find her? Um, unfortunately, this is a, you know, this is a, this is a common theme. Um, this is a good example of the kind of like boilerplate misogyny that we see in some of these books. Um, here's another uh, joke. Swearing and cursing is the language of hell, which people take care to learn before they go thither. Um, and lastly, my favorite, um, very sad little observation, uh, which is the greatest folly in the world is to love the world. Um, Margaret Spufford notes that there were almost as many um, burlesques and kind of anti-female satires um, amongst the small Mary books as there were um, courtship and song books. Um, xenophobia is a constant theme, um, as is mockery of uh, the poor. Um, typical kind of targets in this era tend to be um, Welsh and Scottish people. Um, and, you know, uh, Spufford writes that these books can be sometimes um, quite alien feeling to the modern reader in their kind of total lack of compassion. Um, but again, you know, they're still interesting and in that we're looking at um, the concerns and, and some of the prejudices maybe that people would have had in this era. Um, now we'll talk really quickly about the um, kind of transition to the 19th century and uh, the wane of the chapbook format as we know it. Um, the chapbook that we've discussed so far was in reality a very specific type of publication, and it flourished for um, a relatively short period in the history of British print. The Industrial um, Revolution really changed patterns of settlement in the latter half of the 18th century and the first part of the 19th, and it created uh, a new readership who was hugely different from um, the rural villager who would kind of eagerly await um, the arrival of the Chapman. Uh, the print industry really um, accommodated to expand um, new players outside of traditional trade centers. Um, and in terms of content, we start to see a lot of new groups who are producing periodicals and ephemeral uh, publications. Um, meanwhile, there's an explosion of new um, cheap formats. Uh, one of the commonly cited kind of successors to the chat book is the Penny Blood, which was a, a cheaply printed um, booklet, which told tales of adventure and um, intrigue. Um, and also romantic novels. Um, and we see that publishers also begin to target um, more and more specific groups of readers um, in their pub publications. Um, for example, the Dicey Marshall Press, who produced so much of the, um, of the 18th century's chapbooks, um, identify and begin to um, exploit a new demand for children's literature. Um, by 1793, really only a small portion of their output can be described as um, chapbooks proper. Uh, what's really interesting to me is that we see in this period that as people become more distant from kind of pre-industrialization life ways, the term chapbook begins to be used as a conscious anachronism to describe publications uh, which increasingly incorporate elements of fine print. Um, so for example, in the 19th century, we start to see a whole um, slew of children's chapbooks. These tend to be much more um, expensively produced uh, they include woodcuts on every page um, and also dab coloring on illustrations. I wanted to touch really quickly on uh, the 21st century, sort of 20th and 21st century chapbooks. Um, how, you know, how did we get here? Um, so in our time now, the term chapbook is still being employed as kind of a conscious anachronism, uh, perhaps a nostalgic one to describe publications which um, really increasingly incorporate elements of fine print. So this is an example from a collection I recently processed. Um, this chapbook is called Tomatillo. It's from uh, a small press in Belgium. Um, we see that in terms of its physical format, this chapbook 
looks a little bit like some of the 18th century volumes. So, you know, it's quite small. Um, it has hand stitching to hold it together. Um, but the item, you know, is, is clearly a fine print publication. Um, the whole point of the volume is to make the book look as much like a tomato as possible. Um, and it incorporates a lot of, you know, very beautiful papers to kind of achieve um, that outcome. Um, you know, an idea that I'm still uh, exploring and think is really compelling is that um, I think that the zine um, actually has a lot more in common um, with the 18th century chapbook than the items that we call um, chapbooks do now. Um, the zine is kind of a, a rough and ready publication. Um, you know, it, it's cheaper, it's, it, you know, put together with, you know, kind of poor quality bindings like often staples. Um, so that's kind of an interesting uh, area, I think, for, for folks to think about. I would be remiss if I did not point out at this time that there are some um, other very significant Canadian collections of note. Um, McGill has a wonderful chapbooks collection of, uh, I think, around 900 volumes, and um, they have digitized their volumes and made them available online. This is really like, you know, the dream. So yeah, we hope to get there. Um, and also the University of British Columbia's uh, Rare Books and Special Collections Library um, has as an established collecting area um, 19th century children's literature, and they have um, really wonderful representation of um, the Victorian era children's chapbooks, um, and I have worked with those collections before. Um, lastly, I'm just going to cycle through quickly um, some of the chapbooks that were cited. Um, and I encourage you all to come visit us. Um, this is a picture of our reading room. Uh, we are located in Hamilton, Ontario, in the basement of Mills Memorial Library. We're open to all members of the public and we're open from uh, 10 to four on weekdays. Um, our chapbooks are discoverable through our catalog. And um, if you would like to email us with any questions or to book an appointment, um, please do so. The email address is archives at mcmaster.ca. Here are some uh, we're excited, and now we'll move on to uh, questions if we have time. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you so much, Jillian. That was fantastic and fascinating. Unfortunately, I think we've probably just about reached the limit in terms of um, time. Just mindful that this is people's lunch hour, people might have planned for it. But as Jillian said, do feel free to email her. Um, I would just like to again thank you and thank Myron, Christine, and Dave from Alumni for helping us present this lovely, co-presenting with us on this lovely talk. And if you have any desire to see any of these, all five of the chat books that Jillian spoke about today are digitized and online um, in our digital archive. And I do know that we are working on digitizing more. So hopefully more of them will come. Um, thank you all for joining us and please don't hesitate to get in touch or come visit us in person. Thank you very much and have a good day.